Welcome back to How to Scale Yourself. My guest today is Chuck Copenspire. Chuck, why don't you start off by telling us just a little bit about yourself? Uh, hi, I'm Chuck. Uh, I am a creative and technical problem solver who works in a lot of areas. Um, I work as a consultant, I'm developing an app, and I also run an agency that um, solves a lot of digital strategy problems for people. Uh, basically, I'm just a geek who wants to make the world a better place, and I think accessible web design is where I can contribute to that. And uh, yeah, and I love being on podcasts, so here I am. Excellent. Yeah, that's uh, that's a great uh, intro there, and I think we need a lot more people like you building accessible things um, and, and trying to make the world a better place as opposed to just trying to make money because you can do both. Um, but can. all too often, people just focus on the money part and not the making the world a better place. Uh, so I'd love to just dig in a little bit to your background. Like, how did you end up kind of on this path of doing all these like really cool things kind of all at the same time? Well, it, I've had definitely had a very strange road. Um, I started, I wanted to be an art teacher, but um, I was told that that was stupid. Uh, so I went to school for computer science and it was really, really, really hard, but I did graduate. Um, I started college when I was 16 and I graduated with my bachelor's degree when I was 21. Um, I had a bachelor of arts in computer science. I was one of the first uh, game design graduates from the cheapest school in Washington state. Uh, and, uh, it was a messy degree if I'm completely honest, but I did learn a lot about interactive design. Um, I went on to do interactive art installations. I programmed a bunch of games in flash uh, and action script back in the day. Um, and then got involved with uh, the startup world, uh, through startup Spokane. Um, there was a startup competition. So I came in a weekend and helped somebody build a game. I ended up getting hired at a game studio, worked with the same people who made Myst, which was wild. Oh, nice. um, and so got into, uh, but I was a contractor. It was the first time I worked for myself and I realized I really loved it. Uh, Cause I have, I'm, there's so many ways to tackle this, but I don't like working for other people because they frustrate me uh, because they don't, I don't know. I just need more agility and working alone. I can kind of be more agile, uh, in a way that I enjoy. Um, so, so I got started working for myself, started an illustration business that failed miserably because I did not charge anybody anything, uh, cause I didn't understand business. Um, and so then I went and worked in special effects and props for the sci-fi network for a couple years. Um, got back into tech, uh, after I had a baby, uh, realized how much money was in the startup world, realized how good I still was at tech, even if I don't like programming. Um, and so I was working at the startup, really loved it, got laid off, and then uh, took advantage of a program in Oregon where if you get laid off, they will actually pay you uh, full unemployment for six months while you start a business, if you start a new business, um, which I have done. And it's gone really well this time because I'm not afraid of money anymore. It is weird. Like I, I kind of had the same uh, experience when I left my job and like, I'm gonna go start a business. But it's tough to ask people for money. Mm -hmm. Like if you're not used to it, it's the it's a really weird feeling. Um, so I, I'd love to dig in a little more and kind of like, how did you overcome that? Because it's something I'm still like, getting better at. <laughs> so it's kind of funny. Uh... So my content strategy right now is focused on how to not be a disgusting salesperson because all of the sales trainings teach you how to be a morally reprehensible person who manipulates people, makes them insecure and uh, takes advantage of them in a high pressure situation. All things that are not accessible and not acceptable uh, to me. Um, but by being sold to that way and buying high ticket offers that way, I learned a lot about techniques. And I started to think, how can I use these things that make me so uncomfortable in a way that does feel comfortable? And what am I learning from what's making me uncomfortable here? Because there were people who would handle my objections by belittling me, making me feel more insecure. And I was like, that's not really like they're using language that seems innocuous, but the practice itself is very, um, it's just, I, I always, the joke I make is it feels like a bad date. Like I keep saying no and they keep pressing. And so I think I learned so much from how things made me uncomfortable that I realized I had to create a better way. Um, and by doing that, I started to feel more comfortable and confident in what I was offering. Um, and I started to um, realize that the skills I have are extremely valuable and the things I do for people do help them make thousands of dollars. So it's okay for me to charge 
5,000 if I'm going to make you 20,000. And I think I never thought about it that way before. Like with my illustration business, it was always like, oh, you know, anybody can draw. So obviously this is worthless. And now it's more, it, it's, it's twofold. It's one, what I do has value and it is okay to claim that. And two, um, I have put a lot of time and effort into getting good at this and I'm going to save this person so much time that that's also valuable. Um, so it, it was partly, uh, recognize my value. And I used sales scripts at first, um, when I didn't know what to say. And so now I produce sales scripts that are less gross than the ones I started with, <laughs> um, to help people who are new to sales, because I found that having a script, um, made me feel less lost in the process. And it helped me remember kind of the steps that I needed to go through to make sure they were a good fit. And then, you know, how to move to the next stage, if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, no, that that's great. Um, and that ties in well. So I was listening to a podcast the other day with uh, Daniel Pink. Um, and one of the things he was talking about was kind of this, uh, like transition from kind of a, a sales force that is focused on kind of information asymmetry, right? Like, so in a lot of cases, the seller would have a lot more information about the product than the buyer. And they would kind of use that as leverage right in the negotiations mm -hmm. you know so you want to like prevent the the buyer from knowing certain things and whereas now we have a lot more information parity right like you can just look on your phone and be like you're you're lying to me like i, I see <laughs> this like you know you're not going to be able to to get that over on me um and and i think that ties in really well with like kind of the the gross sales tactics that you know we're used to and then so you've got that kind of information asymmetry and then you add on kind of the, um, you know, the high pressure tactics, the, you know, really digging into insecurities and, and making people, um, you know, feel like they're not enough if they don't buy this product. Like, oh, well, I guess you just want to be a failure then, right? Like, mm -hmm. it's that kind of thing. That, that, that's really incredible that you're working on, you know, building out your own scripts and taking that level of detail and kind of figuring out what works and then um, packaging that up and uh, your varied background. Like, I, I kind of love that, too, because it's like bouncing around and kind of seeing the world from all these different angles. Right. How do you feel that's really helped you uh, position yourself in kind of the, the super valuable ways? Because, you know, that, that's one of the things like when you bring that diverse set uh, of knowledge and experiences into kind of the service offering, I imagine that actually um, allows you to be very unique in your positioning, right? Yeah. And, and it reminds me of one other thing I wanted to say about the sales before I get into that is sure. I think if we switch from thinking about it as a, this is one interaction and I'm going to get the most out of you in this interaction I can versus we're building a relationship and a collaborative partnership that's going to serve both of our businesses for years. I'm always thinking about like, I never high pressure anybody because I don't want to work with someone for 20 years. Who's like that. But I'm trying to build a relationship with someone. So even if I don't get that first sale, people often come back to me two or three months later with a different problem or they refer people to me. And so if, I think of it more like cultivating a garden than like a hunt where you have to like get that one person one time. Um, but yeah, what I'll say about the, the varied background is that, so I didn't mention that I've also been a relationship coach. I've also been a health coach. Um, and so a lot of the people I serve are health coaches. Um, I've also worked in the adult, in, adult industry. Um, and a lot of people I serve are in the adult industry. And what I found is that people who have, um, weird jobs, like talking to me because I have lived experience in those jobs and I know the challenges of those jobs. And so if they'll say like, oh, I'm a coach, but I can't figure out how to get this webinar software to work and funnels don't make any sense. I can say like, oh, I know when I was learning to set those up, it took me six months to figure it out. And they don't even teach you marketing and the coaching programs and, um, so I, I would say it's my lived experience that helps me serve people who have similar lived experience. And that's why I always encourage people with their personal brand to really lean into what makes them different or might even disqualify them. Uh, cause there's a lot of people who are like, how can you talk about your disability? If you're talking about, you know, being a salesperson and being a business person, it's like, well, disabled people love to work with me cause they know <laughs> I'm not going to like expect things of them that make no sense. Um, so I, it's like, if you, I think the best way to conquer with imposters, conquer imposter syndrome is to lead with the thing that 
you're scared of and you will find the people who are so relieved that you brought it up. Yeah, I think that that's absolutely huge because, um, yeah, one, one of the things that I've, I've really seen is that people have a hard time kind of combining the idea of like disability, for example, with success mm -hmm. and they're not mutually exclusive, right? Like it, it means that there are different needs in place, but, um, when somebody can actually like help with those and understands those, then we can get to this place of success, like for, for everybody involved. And it's not this, um, you know, d difficult thing. Like it, it requires coming from a place of empathy and understanding and it can really like help everybody involved flourish. So I absolutely love that. So let's dig in maybe a little bit to uh, what you're offering now and, and kind mm -hmm. of talking about, um, yeah, the services and just kind of like why you think those are important. You know, we, we've talked a bit in the past about kind of like the future is obviously changing very quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I would love to kind of get your, your thoughts and, and feelings on that uh, as we kind of move into this changing landscape. Yeah. Uh yeah, it's interesting. I've been reading a lot about different opinions about AI this morning, so that's on my mind. But um, just as a quick overview of what I do, I um, I own an agency that will build funnels, uh, social campaigns, video campaigns, basically whatever you need to get the word out and be findable. Um, and I try to serve the weirdest business as possible. So if you have a weird business, that's what I like to do with my agency. Um, I do offer one on one consulting and problem solving. If someone has, you know, maybe built their whole thing, but there's one thing they can't figure out. Sometimes I'll spend an hour with them and figure it out. Usually it's copywriting related or yeah, copy, copy related. Um, and then the other thing is I am uh, building an app um, that makes content writing easier for folks. Um, it's like a repurposing tool uh, that will hopefully make cross platform repurposing more accessible for people. Um, and hopefully that gets funded. I have a meeting about that on Friday. Um, Good luck. Uh, so yeah, I'm kind of building an ecosystem that's just trying to make it easier for people to um, know what content is going to be effective and then how to measure what's effective so you can repeat uh, that effectiveness. And it, it takes a lot of the overly technical parts out of it because so many of my clients are overwhelmed by too much information. So it only tells you what you need to know. Um, yeah, that's, that's perfect. Cause the, the one thing is we're not designed, uh, you know, our brains aren't wired to deal with massive amounts of information. Mm -hmm. Um, and so you either need to train yourself to deal with that better. Um, or you need to filter out the noise and mm -hmm. make it tell you exactly what you need to know. So, so that that's excellent. Um, but yeah, I'd, lo I'd love to actually dig into the AI part. And this is mm -hmm. something that I'm, I'm very fond of. And I too have been, lis like, I've been listening to podcasts, reading articles on kind of everything, because I think that the landscape is definitely shifting with AI. So, and I, and I think your background is really um, good to get into this, and, you know, especially like from the, the, you know, the illustrator background and kind of the, mm -hmm. the artistic uh, kind of things. Like, how do you feel about the rise of generative AI? And, and, you know, how have you dealt with that? How have you tried to like, you know, harness the power of generative AI if you have, like, what, what are your thoughts around that? Well, it's interesting because ever since I was a kid, I was always into kind of morbid sci-fi. Like I read a lot of Bradbury. I read a lot of, uh, you know, Jurassic Park and stuff like that at a very young age. And so I've always had a little bit of a dark fascination with where technology can go, you know, following Boston Dynamics over the years, I've been an early adopter of, a, of uh, virtual reality. Um, and it's interesting because I think the implications of what we can do at any given time with the tools we have are either incredibly creative and benevolent or incredibly destructive. And human beings are still ultimately wielding these tools and they're getting more powerful. And so that's why I think having conversations about ethics and business now is really critical um, because people are and can use these AI tools um, for, for good or ill. Um, and so what I'll say from an accessibility standpoint, um, I've heard a lot of people, especially people of color saying that this is the first time that they have had a portrait made of themselves. Um, or, you know, like other people, all kinds of human beings who don't have access to like a paying a portrait artist um, uh, are really appreciating the AI generated portraits. Um, and then people who 
make AI generated or make portraits are disturbed because they're like, oh, well, now I'm out of business. Um, but I think ultimately, like, if there's an artist I like I, and I can afford it, I'll pay them to do that because I like that artist. And it's again about the relationship in some ways and, and connecting with that person. Um, for the writing, and this might be a spicy opinion because I, I know, you know, you're in the AI writing world. Part of why I'm creating this content writing app is that I don't think that AI writing is very good. It's not compelling to me. Like, it, like it doesn't, and maybe it's that I've seen so much of it. I can tell, I can smell it. It's like the uncanny Valley or something like that, but mm -hmm. they're not very good storytellers in my mind. Um, it feels generic, you know, because it is repurposed. So I, I don't see them really pushing the envelope. And I think only human beings can at this point really push the envelope. And I'm, I'm sure we both know that writing is one of the most monetizable skills that a person can have. And I think that good writing is always going to be uh, pushing something forward, not regurgitating something that exists. And I think AI could do that in the future. Absolutely. I'm sure that robots will come up with new ideas, which I think is cool. So <sighs> From an efficiency and accessibility standpoint, I think it's cool that it's getting faster to do things that are hard to do. Um, I'm not threatened by AI because I think there will always be a human element to business that it's partly about the good feeling you get when you work with a person. Um, and yeah, so I don't know. I think it's complicated. I'm not concerned. I think it's interesting. I'll be watching. I'll be playing with it. I think the fact that chat GPT can write code that works is cool uh, because I hate writing code. So if I could just be like, hey, robot, here's this idea I have. I can proofread the code. I can troubleshoot the code. But if I don't have to write it from scratch, that's going to save me hours uh, of development. And, you know, if all of us end up getting worked out of our jobs and we just live in a utopia where we are artists, I thought that was like the whole point, <laughs> you know? Well, that, that, that's kind of the way I view it, too, because um, so, you know, my, my feeling on it is that right now, AI is being able is used to generate like all sorts of things, right? And, mm -hmm. and especially writing. And one of the biggest problems with the internet is it's becoming the same stuff everywhere. Exactly. And AI is simply going to accelerate that part. But by doing that, it's actually going to make people writing about their actual experiences way more valuable. Mm -hmm. And it's going to be, you know, it, it's going to make kind of that individualism extremely like rare because you know most of it's just going to be bullshit mm -hmm. um and so i think from that standpoint it's going to be quite good and then the you know in the accessibility part of it i think you know the the one thing that artists tend to have is you know a knowledge of all sorts of things like it, being an artist isn't just knowing how to draw right like it's mm -hmm. knowing like how to represent things visually. It's, it's, there, there's all sorts of things that go into it. And so if you give someone who has no clue about that, an AI prompt, and they write something super basic, they're going to get something out that'll look way better than they could draw on their own or whatever. Sure. But it's not going to have the same artistic qualities as an artist who is given these tools and knows ex exactly what to say. And one of the um, podcasts I was listening to, I listen to a lot of podcasts, if you can't tell, but... Uh, <laughs> You know, one of the podcasts I was listening to was talking about the fact that there's this um, there's a vocabulary that goes along with it. Right. And like if you don't know how to talk about it, you're not going to be able to get consistent results. But I do think it'll take the learning time down because you're not going to need to know how to do all of this in Photoshop, but you're going to need to learn the concepts around it to know what to ask the AIs for. And this is really where humans can come in. Mm. It's not about you know, just typing in whatever and getting some output. It's about like knowing the right questions to ask because that you're, you're knowing the prompts to give the, the AI um, because there's so many different things we can do with it, but just understanding how to work with it. And so like my belief is that it will give, you know, kind of individuals amazing power to do very cool things kind of on their own and grow that business and then start integrating actual like artists who can kind of put that heart and soul and, and more importantly, technical knowledge into uh, the work. And, you know, I, I think there's a lot of um, potential for artists to build out their own AIs essentially that are built on their style. And so imagine if like you could kind of develop your own style and then sell that as like a product where people can pay 
you know, for access to this model that allows you to just unlock their style and whatever you want to generate. Like, I think that opens up an incredible amount of earning potential for artists way beyond what they could do on this like one of one um, kind of artwork. And then to, to top it all off, it actually is going to make, you know, their individual artwork even more valuable because mm -hmm. then it becomes this, you know, special like boutique item that, um, you know, is then like, so they've got all of this mass produced stuff, but they've got, you know, very individualized commissions. Um, and that gives them the ability to like, so you train the AI in your style and then you work on what you want to work on while the AI does all the stuff that you don't care about. Right. Like, I think to me, that is where the ultimate unlock comes in. That's very interesting because I, you know, it makes me think about how, you know, I can go to Walmart and get a, a t-shirt, but then like what Kanye was selling, selling like white t-shirts with the Kanye logo for, you know, a hundred dollars or more or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. and so those personal brands can really elevate items price. And it also makes me think about NFTs because so many NFTs are procedurally generated and I'm sure plenty of them are made from AI art now. Um, and I'm really interested in, uh, you know, like you say, that unique object and the value of that unique object and even getting to brag like, oh, well, this is, this is actually hand painted by this artist. And, you know, there's, there's the, the whole clout factor of having that unique object. Mm -hmm. I, think that's, I think that that sort of authenticity and uniqueness and branding are going to play a lot into the next 20 to 30 years of commerce, especially as the basics get more and more commodified. And I pray, pray that a benevolent uh, AI manages our global resources. Like I fully, <laughs> yes, please. Uh, you know, I'd love human beings to be able to, to check on that, but um, I do not trust humans to manage our resources. I would love, <laughs> love an AI to, to help us with that. Yeah. I think that would be, um, Pretty good because unfortunately, yeah, humans in, alloc in, in resource allocation are not good. Um, it, it's that th there's so much temptation around it, right? And then, you know, and, and I think that that's really where, you know, good oversight can come in. But then it's like, okay, well, now the, you know, the, the people who are overseeing it also kind of, you know, fall prey to some sort of corruption. Um, and, and, and I don't even think it's like necessarily um, corruption, but you know, as you were kind of talking about earlier, right? Business is based off of human relationships. And so if you're in a position of power and you've built up all these relationships with people, like you, you know them, you know what they offer. And so you want to make deals kind of there, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's like money kind of centralizes into these, you know, different human networks because that's who they know and trust. Mm -hmm. um, and so giving AI a sense of, who to trust, who could be, you know, the, the most beneficial for a certain, you know, role or, you know, service or, or whatever. Right. Like, I think that's um, where it comes in because we're getting to a point where there's going to be able to, you know, people are going to be able to kind of do whatever services they want. And it goes back to kind of the artist and, you know, having the AI assistant to kind of take care of the stuff that they don't want to do, but is still, you know, generating revenue for them. Um, and so I think a lot of people are going to be able to do that and kind of, you know, figure out a way to kind of package up their skills into some sort of product that they can sell over and over again mm -hmm. and then spend the time on the stuff they enjoy. Um, and, and so they're going to become very skilled in different areas. And, and so figuring out how to make that understandable by an AI, I think is one part of it. But then also just like, I think there's a lot of benefit in just building out like, actual social networks that are beneficial to, to everybody involved. And you can mm -hmm. hear the, the idea of the network effect, but it's more, you know, kind of in, in the, the VC world network effect is simply like adding more people to the network makes it better. Um, and I think we've seen with like Twitter, that's not necessarily true, right? Like one of the biggest sure. benefits on Twitter is finding your small social network that you enjoy being part of and finding people that you can interact with and enjoy talking to. Um, so it makes that discoverability better, but then like you get to a certain point and relationships start growing weaker and weaker because you can't handle that many relationships. Um, and so I think there, there, a lot of it goes down to like understanding who it is that, you know, building strong relationships with a few people to kind of, you know, help you in areas that, uh, you know, maybe you're not the best at and then getting recommendations. 
something that that jogged in my memory is I uh, I wanted to tell you that I had just done a competitive analysis of everyone in my niche who I look up to, mm -hmm. and a hundred percent of their top performing posts are really simple storytelling carousels. One hundred percent of every business coach's top performing content is storytelling, and it's usually kind of raw storytelling and vulnerable storytelling and funny and bold and you know controversial. And I think that kind of stuff is still going to be hard for AI to write. Like AI can totally write like, here's the top three kinds of Facebook posts you can make for engagement. It's like, okay, there's 45,000 articles on that, that you can regurgitate, but the spicy storytelling, um, I don't think you can, you can replace that. So it's actually funny that you say that because one of the things that I, I was playing around with GPT three a bit with, and, um, so I actually like gave it the instruction to, um, be a contrarian thinker and come Ooh. up with like, um, y you know, uh, differing opinions to like, well, first of all, I said trending topics. And the first thing it did was become an anti-vaxxer. Uh, oh, <laughs> so okay. I was like, okay, this is, uh, maybe that's not great. Um, but then I actually got a little more specific with it and said, you know, in, in, instead of kind of trending topics, I said, you know, be, like you're a contrarian thinker who is, um, you know, working in technology and pick uh, to pick a technology and give kind of a, a controversial opinion on it, right? Um, and it actually did really well talking about things like AI and um, you know blockchain and, and cryptocurrency that sort of thing. Okay, like it gave some kind of like nuanced uh, arguments uh, and like I, I think for the blockchain, I'll have to see if I can um, find that again. But one of the things it mentioned was like. You know, it's not going to um, change everything immediately. Uh, you know, it's not this like ultimate solution for for everything, but it can be implemented in like very specific cases to where it would be very very useful. And it's like, wow, this AI has more sense than a lot of our investors, um, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, out there. But that that's kind of uh, you know, and again, I think it comes back to like knowing how to talk to the AI and knowing what you're, you're getting out of it. Because mm -hmm. the thing is, as kind of someone pointed out with chat GPT, it'll uh, output the complete correct answer or the complete wrong answer with the same level of conviction. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so at that point, it doesn't become, you know, being able to get these answers out of it, it, it becomes knowing which one's correct, right. Mm -hmm. And so the people who learn to think as alongside AI and kind of use it as, uh, you know, I, I think a conversational partner is really interesting because you can use it to kind of bounce things back and forth, potentially gain insights and then dig further into those insights, right? Like it's not this like one-off thing where you generate it and throw it out into the world and that's it. Um, I've really been looking at how I can use it to just, yeah, clarify thought processes, you know, maybe take ideas that I've already got and package them up in different ways, like kind of like you were talking about, right? Like, you know, taking one idea and posting it to multiple social media networks, mm -hmm. um, because different types of content perform well on different platforms. And, and I think, mm -hmm. you know, again, all of that knowledge of like what to ask for, and, and you know, then knowing which one is good, that's where the human element comes in, it becomes so much more about knowing what to do than knowing how to do it. The AI can do it all, right? And that's, right. Um, and kind of skill development, one of the things that I've been looking at is it's a lot cheaper and easier to teach an AI how to do something. Um, so we need to kind of shift the way we think about education and, and get away from this idea of like, here's how to push this button to do this thing, because that's not particularly useful. Here's why you push the button. Here's the kind of background beyond it. Um, you know, here's what, what you're looking to, to get out of it. And then taking that knowledge and applying it to these different systems that allow you to do all sorts of different things. Like, I think that unlocks, uh, so much more of human potential, but we've got to get to that point without the world burning down because people start flipping out about stuff they don't understand. And that's kind of the trick with, uh, humanity, right? Like <laughs> we'll see how it goes. It's funny. Uh, I'm, I'm watching, uh, Star Trek, uh, the next generation for the first time. My partner's obsessed oh, with Star I Trek. I love Star Trek, the next generation. So. It's really good. And I just watched this uh, episode where this advanced race relied so much on AI that they forgot the basics. They were incredible mm -hmm. artists, but they didn't know how to diagnose illness. They didn't know how to build things. They didn't know how to do 
almost any tangible skill. And so they ended up, uh, the race was dying off because they didn't realize that the AI, that what was powering it, the radiation was killing everyone. And so it, it was just like, you know, all these long-term implications of if we don't know, like I was thinking about if we used AI to diagnose melanoma, what if we only relied on AI to diagnose melanoma and no human beings knew how to do it? Um, it makes me think about how, you know, like all of the, uh, the trades are sort of falling out of favor and people are, you know, losing the ability to, to know how to do stone masonry. There's almost no stone masons. Like that's such a great career for somebody who wants to go into that. Cause there's nobody our age doing it. Nobody my age doing it. And, um, it's like a huge opportunity that people don't think about cause they're trying to learn blockchain. Um, but we still are always going to need somebody who knows how to do that, or at least can tell a robot how to do that. Um, so it's interesting because I don't want us to lose these, these core skills. Um, like for instance, I know foraging, um, I know a lot about how to find food in the desert. So in the event that things do go very, very bad, um, I'm going to be okay. Um, but, <laughs> uh, I think it's, I think that's the part about AI that scares me the most is just us losing the ability to interface with our world, um, in the event that AI were to break down. Yeah, that, that's a, that's a great point. And actually, um, yeah, it, it does really talk a lot to um, the way there's been kind of this influx into tech. Um, and and I'm, I'm kind of of, of two minds of it. Um, first of all, I'm actually like, I think it's a, it's a really good thing, especially people from varied backgrounds, because uh, I have kind of this saying that one of the problems with tech is that there's too many tech people in tech. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I say this as a tech person in tech, right? Like I dedicated my life to tech. I, I, you know, went to school for computer science. I've been doing it forever because I love technology. Mm -hmm. And sometimes that is really good at blinding you to the real world. Um, because you, you want to build solutions that solve problems that technology creates, not actually solving problems that people have. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so I, I think... And again, it kind of goes to this skill thing. Like, so we, we've got all these people coming in um, to kind of learn these skills that then AI is also learning how to do and will probably be better at it than most people. Um, and I think that's going to lead to a higher valuation among the the humanities backgrounds and people who actually understand people. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so it, it always kills me when I see like people complaining about like, oh, well, you know, like, don't know who would spend that much money on like a liberal arts degree and like, in, instead of like doing something useful like tech. And it's like, well, okay, that liberal arts degree is actually going to be worth way more here um, before you realize it, because these hard skills are going to be replaceable much faster than an understanding of human nature. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think college has completely like skewed this cost benefit analysis anyway, to where people can't um, get a good understanding of that. But I, to go back to kind of the, the, the masonry and things like that, as we start to see um, deficiencies in kind of uh, these positions, they're going to start getting paid more and more. And then as people see that, then they're going to push, you know, their kids to like, oh, well, you should just do this because it pays a ton. Because unfortunately, that's what drives um, mm -hmm. a, a lot of people's decision making toward their future is like, how can I earn a good living? Um, and so it, it is very tech heavy right now. But I think that as we go on, there's going to be a shift back to more physical skills because those are going to become more scarce and therefore higher valued. Um, right now, there's kind of this weird influx, mostly because of VC money that has completely pumped up the tech industry and overinflated mm -hmm. salaries. Um, and so that's all going to end up coming back down because, again, anybody's going to be able to really do it. And I think, you know, people are going to be taught at least the basics of programming at young ages. Um, you know, I, I'm certainly like working with my kids to kind of teach them at least that logical decision making, if not, you know, actual coding, although my, my youngest is starting to get into designing his own Roblox games, which I think is Aww. awesome. Um, but, you know, I, so I think there, there is going to be a, a shift. Uh, and again, like, how long does that take? And how much does the shortage? How, how far does the shortage go before people actually realize that that's a thing? Um, and so I think it would actually be interesting to have some sort of site to kind of, um, or, or, you know, database, whatever it may be, to track kind of the wages of some of these trades, right? Because um, I think there is a lot 
of uh, value there. And once you make people aware of it, then there's going to be people who see that problem and say, well, let, how can we get people educated in this? Can we do it way, with, with ways outside of traditional education? Can we get, instead of just trying to get people to reskill from whatever they're doing into tech, can we get them from tech into masonry, right? Like, you know, how can we um, make these transitions as easy as possible? Because I think one of the things that we're really getting into in the future is that learning like one main skill and running that through life is not going to be nearly enough. It's going to be yeah. constantly, you know, retraining yourself, learning new things, um, because that, that's one thing that the internet gives us more than anything is the ability to learn anything. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, like just being able to take that power and directing human power into wherever it needs to be as quickly as and efficiently as possible. Right. Like, I think that's um, really where that value that gets valued. And then all of a sudden it becomes, Oh, well, I see that there's this huge demand for, you know, Masons in my area. I'm going to quickly figure out how to, you know, be a Mason. I'm going to get some sort of certification for it and I'm going to go apply my trade there. Like all of a sudden, like, you know, the idea of the, the handyman being a, you know, person that you pay like a few bucks to fix whatever, all of a sudden they become very high skilled in many different areas because they can be. Mm -hmm. um, and especially when you factor in like VR and being able to actually get hands-on experience without you, you know, breaking a whole bunch of stuff in the process. Like um, I, I think that leads to something potentially really cool, but we have to realize that we still need that stuff <laughs> and like not do just tech. Well, and I was thinking about this today. Uh, I, I've seen that some younger generations are rejecting social media. And I think because of the pandemic, there's been such a huge focus on like, this is where you have to do business. This is where you have to do relationships. Everybody's on the internet and don't talk to your neighbors. And last night I had the idea to start making these like goofy pins um, for Magical Weirdo, which is this new like personal brand thing I'm doing. Um, and I was like, wouldn't it be fun if I just gave these to all my neighbors and I became like a local celebrity? And I was like, nobody talks about the power of that, but like, there's plenty of business owners I could talk to at the grocery store or at the bank or whatever. And I think we've really like lost that, um, you know, how we built businesses starting from our front door and going outwards before the internet. And I think a lot of people get so lost in the algorithm and trying to get the most followers and all that. That's not really like how I've made the most sales is it doesn't have to do with volume. It has to do with quality. And so well, I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna, what's that? I was gonna say that that's just it. And like the social media has skewed our perception of what's actually valuable. Right. And what success is and, and what, what business is. And so I'm, I'm planning to run a, a local campaign and just to see what comes of it, because I don't think anybody's doing that anymore. And so I'll be curious to see if younger generations, you know, after like disgust at seeing you know, my child sees me on my phone all the time. Maybe she'll be like, I hate phones. I'm only gonna, you know, work in the physical realm because the digital realm is repulsive to me. You know, we can see all kinds of backlash and rejection of, of um, social media uh, always being connected. There might be really hard boundaries that future generations create around that, that we don't have today. Um, and I, I'd, I'd be really curious to see if that happens because it's like with social media, it sometimes feels like you're taking a bite of an apple that never makes you feel full. Uh, and that's what it's designed to do, right? Uh -huh. Like, and that's, yeah. that's the thing, because the whole basis of making it based on advertising revenue, the only time they really make money is when you're on the site. So what do they want to do? They want to keep you on the site as much as possible. Mm -hmm. And so everything was designed around all of that. And so something that, that I've been really working on is trying to build tools that help me get the maximum value of social media while being on it as little as possible. Mm -hmm. Like, um, you know, cause I, I've got ADHD and it's, it's bad. And so it is super easy for me to get sucked into, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, just scrolling and whatever. And it's something that like, I see so much potential and I've built so many cool relationships on Twitter. Um, but also like I've, I've spent way too much time on Twitter and like got nothing out of it because the, like the, the default state of Twitter is bad. And that's kind of, um, I'm trying to do a lot around the idea of like, what if the default state of social media was good? What if it was actually focused on building real relationships? Mm -hmm. Um, and I love what you're talking, uh, what you're talking about in, in terms of like 
doing things locally as well, because one of the, the kind of hypotheses I've got going into the future is there's going to be a rise of small tech. And mm -hmm. right now you see it kind of with indie hackers, but I, I think it's going to get even more to the point of um, being like local small business tech. So instead of everybody, you know, in, in a small town having a Facebook page, because that's the easiest way for them to get online, I see kind of these like, many local social networks that even if they are based on advertising, they're at least based on advertising to a, a very small set of people. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't need to be as extreme, but beyond advertising, I think it's the power of word of mouth and mm -hmm. saying like, Hey, if you need, you know, if you need a barber, here's a local barber who does great. And like, this is what they did for me. And you're filtering out all of this, like extra, like bot traffic and noise of like, Oh, well, if I need to get like reviews, I'll just automate a process to like add reviews all the time. Right. And it's like, you lose this, you have no idea who these people are. Like, how can I trust their opinion? Like, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, starting off, it was like, oh, well, this has five star reviews. And now it's like, you look at Amazon, it's like some of these products, the way they do it is they'll like shift the product, but like keep the reviews. Have you ever noticed that? Like where it mm -hmm. seems like, like the reviews are for completely different products. Um, and so I think it's going to get a lot more down to this, like localized trust word of mouth with people that you actually know and that a lot of that is is like you know small town um and if i were better i would do more of that in like my small town but i hate talking to people like actually face to face i love talking to people <laughs> online um it's uh yeah it, it, it's weird but <laughs> Well, and you know, it's funny, you mentioned like having an online community on Twitter too. And something I've found is, you know, I'm, I'm in Slack groups for, you know, queer entrepreneurs. I'm in a small business, mighty networks group. I'm in a circle group for digital creators. And when I show up to those meetings where we just like check in for the week and talk about how we're doing and what we're working on, I get more leads from all of those groups of like this chunk of 40 people that are interested in things, this chunk of a hundred people who are into this thing than I do from all of my social media. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious if social media is going to shift more to like not Facebook groups, but these, these network groups that are based around affinities or skills um, or collaboration because everybody hires everybody in the group. Right. Um, and there is that word of mouth and that mutual vetting because we see each other on the zoom check-ins and we see each other in the comments, helping each other out. And uh, that sort of um, like niche credibility I'm finding is really paying off. Um, I would say on LinkedIn also, um, Instagram, Instagram is such a strange beast these days. I don't know if you saw the updates that now carousels, they're pushing carousels, they're moving out of video. They're like, eh, TikTok one video, we're giving up. Um, so like I said, they're push, pushing carousels. And they've also now admitted that Instagram is no longer a place to connect with friends and family. It is, it is for niche, niche topic affinities. Um, it's no longer a friends and family app. So that means there is no friends and family app right now. Great opportunity for somebody out there who wants to build one. I don't Actually, think I know there's that. at least uh, one person doing it or, or at least one, one company. Um, I actually interviewed uh, the co-founders for this podcast. So they're uh, a platform called story arc, Ooh, um, story art or story, story arc. arc. Uh, ARK, I believe. So they're, they're a European company and it's focused on like fully encrypted, like small scale social networks for like friends and family. Like instead of doing this, like, you know, huge, like giant social networks with every, it's like, no, these, these very individualized encrypted social networks for like sharing the stuff that, you know, are, are actually like close to people and, and, you know, not worrying about it, like spreading like wildfire. And I, I thought that was like a fascinating um thing because yeah as i said I'm, I'm really invested in the kind of how uh social networking is changing because mm -hmm. I, I think so much of it needs to go back to um building relationships and we've let social media teach us how to build relationships badly yeah. um and superficial when, yeah and, and so That's... and it comes down to this whole like you know the the interaction in the moment being the entire relationship and i think with like the small groups the reason that's so effective is because it happens over time it's not this instant follow and now we're connected no that doesn't mean anything right like mm -hmm. um it, it's that i've shown up and i've talked about what i'm doing like over and over and over again and people see that and they're like oh well i should ask you because you obviously know what you're talking about you're here every <laughs> single week talking about the, the the things you're doing 
And so again, like the AI stuff, it's going to give people the ability to generate all sorts of shit, but it's all going to be shit. And it's the people who are writing about like the stuff that they are doing, like the interesting stuff they are doing in their lives and attracting inter like people to them because they are interesting and not because they convinced pe the world that they were interesting when they're not actually doing any of it, right? Like, and that was kind of the Instagram influencer. You just make it appear like you're living some lavish lifestyle. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, it's this rented private jet that you get some pictures on. So you look like you're super successful mm -hmm. and like that that doesn't actually like get you anywhere now. I mean, it, it still does to some extent, but it's getting less and less effective. Whereas the people who actually are working on cool things, the people who are learning, the people who are experimenting, those mm. are the people who are going to be very, very successful going forward because the rest of it's just going to be shit and everyone's going to be like, get, get tired of it. Um, right. And you see it to some extent now, but it's, it's going to continue happening more and more as we, people use AI to just flood the internet with stuff that doesn't actually matter. Um, right. Yeah. And I think, you know, everybody talks about like, no trust with your content strategy. And I think the community is sort of add to that, like, no trust and even adds to that, you know, people need to see your name seven times before they buy from you. It's like, well, if you're in a community and you're in a chat room together, that person's going to see your name a lot more and there's way less competition. Um, and what's also interesting is, you know, you talk about the content being pumped out. I think about how on YouTube, there's so much AI generated videos now with like, even the, the text and the images and all of it, it's all AI generated. And some people are so excited about it. They're like, wow, it's gonna save me so much time. It's like, I'm not gonna watch that. It's horrible to listen to. And I'm not entertained in any way. Um, but I think we made a, might have touched on this earlier. People are afraid to talk about times that they've struggled or things that they're struggling with right now because they're afraid that it's going to affect their credibility. And I don't think they realize that vulnerability is how we build relationships. Showing like I have struggled or I have chronic fatigue or I, my three-year-old is making me, you know, <laughs> is melting my face off uh, with her, uh, you know, the things she says to me, you know, those are the things that connect us. Um, you know, my people sharing about the loss of a pet or whatever, like that is where we really come together as humans not i made a hundred thousand dollars this year and i can teach you how to do it too it's like well but that'll get likes it, and, and you see it too like the, for people who are going to probably copy and regurgitate your content well well and, and that that's kind of the funny thing the stuff that tends to perform well on social media and which then trains people to post more of that stuff on social media is the stuff that doesn't actually have any real bearing and it's like <laughs> as an indie hacker if you want a post to like have a good chance of going viral post your revenue stats Mm -hmm. Like people love that and they will like it and they will share it like, oh, that's great. And they will celebrate you. And then they'll completely forget about you because it doesn't actually mean anything. Um, yeah. But those yeah. numbers go up. And so when we're focusing on the numbers and, and saying like, this is what dictates success, mm -hmm. we allow ourselves to be trained into posting stuff that doesn't matter. I think people who get there the long way and like they'll build up the follower count and whatever, and then realize that like that didn't actually matter nearly as much as they thought it would. Mm -hmm. um, it it kind of goes full circle and then they're like, oh, well, I actually needed to like start building real relationships. And weirdly, when you build real relationships uh, and especially do so like publicly on, on Twitter and you're, you know, actually like talking back and forth with people that ends up making you grow a lot faster than just trying to like post things that go viral. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and you know, it is this, uh, it's this weird thing because it, it doesn't fit the normal view of social media. And it's like, cause you, all you're seeing is like, you're seeing these numbers go like huge for certain things. And so you're like, Oh, these people are successful. So I need to copy what they're doing because they're successful. And in reality, you're completely missing um, the main point of it, which ends up coming down to, to building relationships and, you know, connecting with people on a human level. Uh, something I've been trying to tell my clients a lot is the gems are in the DMs. Oh, yeah. If you're really talking to people in the DMs, like you and I have chatted in the DMs over the past, what, six months to a year, you know, yeah. and, um, you know, have had some really good conversations. And that's why we're here today. But if I had just like liked your tweet and moved on, you know, we wouldn't be here. Um, and I, uh, it's also interesting. You said the normal view of what success is. 
I almost feel like the people who are selling the courses about how to succeed on social media are telling us what success looks like because it's what they can sell to us. But mm -hmm. what success actually looks like is so much more intangible, I think, than those vanity metrics. And people are uncomfortable with, <laughs> with things that aren't clearly defined. Um, and so I think that's why that narrative rises, even if it's not really that accurate. Yeah, I think so. And and one of the, the kind of trends that I've noticed too, is that people will be successful with something one time and then sell a course on it and like spend the rest of their life, like telling people how they got successful at this one thing. I'm not saying it's all bad, mm -hmm. but it's like not this recipe for success that they think it is. And, and a lot of it has to do with like being early on platforms, for example. And I saw this a lot with medium, like people who were successful on medium early on, were then like releasing all these courses um, about how to be successful on medium. Well, medium has changed so much mm -hmm. and, and it's like, they were successful early on because medium had a vested interest in like making early people successful so that other people would visit medium. And eventually you end up in the cycle of like, you know, now medium is like, it's inundated with people like, here's how I made X amount of dollars doing this thing because people are looking for ways to make money. Mm -hmm. And so talking about how you're making money, people are like, Oh, I should do it. But that's not the, that's not the repeatable part of the process. The repeatable part of the process is finding something you're interested in digging into it, becoming skilled at some part of it, offering those services, offering that knowledge, you know, packaged up in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, and so like part of it's the, the knowledge and then part of it is the you know, packaging for whatever, uh, platform you're trying to, to put it on. And so a lot of times we think that it's like only the, the packaging on like a site like medium that matters and that that's not it at all. It's actually yeah. all the other stuff that goes into it that we never really give much thought to. Yeah. And I think it's true that people will take a course and try something and then they'll resell that information. And over time it starts to become out of date. Like I've recently taken some trainings on email marketing. But based on my data, those old methods don't work. They're just still being sold mm -hmm. um, and taught. But now everyone has bought and sold that email marketing course and everyone is doing the same thing. And so all the emails are ending up in spam uh, or, you know, not being read because everyone's doing the same thing, which, you know, we're, we're almost out of time, but pattern interrupt is so crucial. And that's, I think that's another thing that AI will struggle with because AI does the patterns, but I think human beings who can effectively pattern interrupt uh are the ones who are going to win well, that, um, because that's there's going to be so yeah. much you know a sea of of homogenous content if you can really stand out that's 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 yeah. the key i think spot on there um and that's one, one of the things i always kind of ask myself is like if i try to like share information what happens if people take that information and do it badly at scale because mm -hmm. um, that's typically what what happens right and so like people will take an idea and then implement it badly, but they'll do it a lot because the internet's just a numbers game, right? Like, you know, mm -hmm. you just need to hit like one sale out of 10,000 emails because you can send emails so much. And then it's like, okay, but you know, like 99.9% .9 of that um, then ends up like as junk and it makes people like become resistant to that level of communication, which again, yeah. it comes down to like building relationships. If you can actually connect with people on a human level, um, and, and you know how to do that part of it, um, and worrying less about the at scale part and more about using definite targeting and like talk to people who are specifically, you know, able to be benefited by your offering or whatever. And we kind of talked about that in the beginning. So I think that that kind of brings things back around really nicely because it, it all comes down to that human connection. But I'd love to just ask if there are any like insights or anything you can share, like just from kind of your journey and experience that uh, we haven't really touched on um, that you think the, the audience might be interested in. I would say if I had one bite-sized piece of advice for uh, content strategy, focus on storytelling and don't worry about hashtags right now. All right. Well, excellent. Uh, thanks so much for your time, Chuck. This has been